friends, art enthusiasts, and students. Um, welcome to the final gallery talk for Franklin White, America and Venezuela. We are going to have a lot of fun today, um, but this is our version of you know, doing this last gallery talk. It's going to be more of an art conversation. Um, this is our beloved mm -hmm. professor and artist, Franklin White, and his former student, Susan Lago Arthur. My name is Dr. Chantel Ibernard, and as curator of Franklin White in American and Venezuela, I feel that art is akin to literature in that it tells a story without words. Something else is happening behind the scenes to the artist and within the artist. There's always another story that can be told, but it has to happen retrospectively. Today we will have the unique opportunity to see how the student and the professor have evolved artistically, professionally, and personally. But if you don't know a little bit about each of them, you have to indulge me a minute to just tell you about their accolades and their background. I'll start with Suzanne. Suzanne Lago Arthur is an accomplished contemporary realist painter, an educator and content creator from Loudoun County, Virginia. She was born in Puerto Rico from parents of Cuban American heritage. Suzanne holds a BFA from the Corcoran School of Art and a master's degree in museum studies from George Washington University. She's exhibited in both nationally and international venues. She's exhibited in the Corcoran Gallery of Art, the Art Museum of the Americas in Washington, D.C., and the United States Intersection in Havana, Cuba. She is the concept curator for the Creative Contemplation Podcast. She also has listeners, would you believe this, on nearly six continents. She has a huge following for her podcast. And not to worry, she has some archives, so if you want to listen to one, just visit her website. Her podcasts are publications that she has interviewed several artists. Um, she just interviewed Franklin White. Uh, that one is available. You can catch that on her website as well. Um, but please be sure to go out there and see it. Suzanne is widely recognized in various other publications and is active in the American Women Artists, Oil Painters of America, and the International Guild of Realism. She is also a copyist at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. That is Suzanne Lago. The man of the hour, Franklin White, is an old pastel painter. He's a retired educator, a world traveler. He was born in Richmond, Virginia. He began working as an artist at an early age. He received awards in watercolors while back in high school. He holds a BFA and an MFA from Howard University. And as a professional artist, his work spans nearly six decades. Franklin White has exhibited in numerous solo and group exhibitions and museums around the world, primarily in the United States and in Venezuela. Franklin is a retired professor of over 30 years from the Corcoran College of Art and Design. He has also taught at the Maryland College of Art and Design and Georgetown University. He was selected as a premier Liquitex artist in the early 2000s and has traveled to represent the brand around the world. Franklin White has been also the subject of an award for a winning video called For the Love of Paint, and he was highlighted in a documentary called Sport and Art. You are standing in his most recent exhibition that is a retrospective of his beloved relationship with Merida Venezuela, Franklin White. So, let's talk. between a beloved professor and his former student. As I said, they are now um, colleagues and peers and they're fans of each other's work. So I'm gonna facilitate some questions and just bear with me, they'll answer the questions. I promise you at the end, you'll get to ask lots of questions. So for the first question, um, I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to get to know how these two came to be. Um, Franklin White, can you tell me a little bit about your first impression 
of Suzanne as a student. Uh, you were her professor. Um, so we want to kind of know what you were thinking about this student. Well, first of all, she was wonderful. Oh, yes. It's on. Is it on? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Right up to your mouth. Right up to the Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> no, Su well, you know, Suzanne was a go getter. She was always uh, involved in class activities. She was one of the uh, class leaders. Uh, we ended up, uh, I just had a lot of respect and admiration for how hard she worked. And, uh, and she was, was Latina, so uh, that helped because any student who spoke Spanish, but I had to talk to them and, and increase my uh, Spanish vocabulary. Uh, I remember her mother sent me a, a, a textbook so I could help uh, with, with, uh, help me with my Spanish. But she was a wonderful student. Uh, she was hardworking. We ended up uh, going to uh, Amsterdam together for spring break. Uh, colleague Janice Goodman and I, uh, Janice was going to Amsterdam and so doing spring break we said let's take some students to Amsterdam. So Jan, uh, uh, well five of you. Yes. And she was one of them. We were trying to, oops, no. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to remember who, who went on the trip and we couldn't right. completely remember. We, right. But her mother handed her over to me. And whether I re whether I wanted to or not, you are responsible. So here she is. Take her. But I always had a lot of admiration for her and a lot of the students. But uh, we had well, this after all these years, it's been 20 years or longer, and we still keep in touch. And thanks to uh, Facebook and social media, I'm in touch with a lot of my family students, and I'm looking around and seeing a bunch of them here as well. So. Well, thank you, Franklin. This, I just want to say that I'm just, I'm so thrilled to even be in Franklin White's orbit to be here today. It's just such an honor, and I'm so grateful. And just hearing your recollections of school really brings me back. Like I'm remembering, I had Franklin in my foundation's drawing course, um, first year with Janice Goodman, um, who's also another one of my beloved professors, um, and also somebody on the podcast that so you can listen on season one. I interviewed her, um, but. What I remember, you know, I have so many wonderful memories of that class. And one thing that I remember hearing you say about how hardworking I was, do you remember how the, the grading structure was, it was how it was classified that there was one A that was given out to the students? Do you remember this? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember. There was one A that was allowed to the entire class, and the rest of us got A minuses or Bs. Yes. Or oh, yeah, it was a ranking order. And I remember being super competitive about wanting to get that A every single time we had an assignment. Okay. That's like one of my, <laughs> okay. one of my memories. I was always remember you this so bad. I always remember you as being uh, such a, a good student. So I didn't really need to do that. I knew that if, if when she put her work up, it's going to be talked about. And uh -huh. she's going to see to that. So, and I love, that's what I'm, I love like about uh, students. Janice and I always say, well, the cream always rises to the top. So no matter how many students you have, the good ones that you're going to recognize, even if it was in terms of way of teaching, uh, you could see uh, the, the good students. They're going to make you see them. They're going to make you, and that's what they should do. I was uh, t uh, telling, um, because I did that to my uh, teachers. Uh, I, I had a favorite teacher, a Lois Mayer Jones, and I said, uh, I was telling the friend, if I thought, if I had a pint of her blood and make me a better artist, I would have asked her for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's what the good students will do. And so we have to do that. Well, I'm also struck with, when I went to the corporate, I was there from 92 to 96. And um, realism was not really in vogue at that time, but I was gifted with two phenomenal realist uh, painters, the two of you, you and Janice, my foundation year. So, you know, that was really quite an education because after that, there wasn't a whole lot of realism for people that were interested in realism. Well, I should have that, yeah. especially when I was teaching the first year. Uh, you can do anything you want after you leave, but uh, as a teach I want to give you a good foundation, a good structure. It's though if, if you were a dancer, I believe that you should take classical ballet before you take modern. And so you should draw in a very academic way. Once you learn it and then if you choose to forget it. 
but move on. But I want, if you leave me, I'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you had a good structure to build on and then go from there. And there are times when I didn't recognize when I see you in your fourth year, I don't recognize what you do, but that's fine. Learn it and then forget it. Or take what you need from each of us and then move on from there. That's fine. And I see Lynn shaking her head because we taught together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, partners. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Well, with that, and, and, and just the commonality there that um, I'm probably going to roll into one of your other questions, but yeah, the, both those professors were really into drawing at the time, Janice as well as you, um, and so like you have always had this love for drawing and this fluid line between drawing and painting, which I, I myself interpret painting the same way that I interpret drawing. They're kind of just flip it's sides a of a coin, thin line, line. More than whereas more te technically, um, you know, they're spoken about very different. You know, the, the, you have your drawing stage and then you have your painting stage, and, and painting is spoken about in terms of like massing and planes, um, and drawing tends to be more, uh, you know, more linear, uh, and Franklin beautifully weaves that together, but he predominantly has this beautiful linear line. It, 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 it's hard to, after a while, it's hard to know uh, where drawing uh, uh, stops and painting takes over. And for me, it's hard to separate the two. Even within one work, I might pick up a crayon and it might make a drawing mark. And then I might pick up the same crayon and move it someplace else and it'll just dissolve, right? And I end up matching again with my thumb. So it switches back and forth throughout the work. Uh, and there are times I see these crayons are mine of their own, and I never know what they're going to do. But you do it and see what happens. Uh, and you don't second guess yourself. You make that mark, commit yourself to the mark, make it, and then uh, whatever happens, happens. You can always take it out later. But I find if I go back, it loses its spontaneity, it loses its pressure. Make the mark, commit yourself to the mark, and simply leave it alone in love. And even the, the technique that he uses, what he calls the us. Do you want to talk about that? Well, well, yes. I mean, it's, I was in the studio working on one of these pieces, and the notion of it being, uh, well, the earlier works are more on the drawing side. The later works become more painterly, and I always said that uh, uh, my drawings have this sort of painterly quality. I wouldn't call them paintings per se. Well, then I didn't. Now it, the line is forever. It's, it's either it's both. It switches back and forth. And so I used to wake up and say, "Well, I'm going to start the new drawing." Now I'm just saying I'm going to start the new whatever it is because I can't. I'm not defining it as a painting or a drawing. It's moving more toward paint at this point. But the book open to a drawing. These are drawing paintings. And so I decided it sounds so much nicer in Spanish, the Bubo Pintura. And so that's what I, I guess I should call the, these the Bubo Pinturas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing a great job. <laughs> no, me. We're not living here. Um, one thing that I neglected asking you about on the podcast was your influences. So how did we arrive where we are today in terms of your marketing? Okay. okay. Well, I mean, I've always drawn and I've always painted. And I remember, um, uh, oh, okay, I'm going to date myself. In, in 1962 or 63, uh, at 21st and P, there was this uh, building, that was, I think it was called the Washington Young and Modern Art, right? In that building. And in that, I, I saw my first Franz Klein show there. And I also saw my first Beaver Gods. And I saw three awards of Beaver Gods. And uh, it's not mine. I, uh, I began, he just swallowed me up, and I, would, I did my demon coins. And, and then I get upset. Oh, you look at demon coins. Okay. Uh, I covered this man blatantly, and yet I got upset because I didn't say he had never seen it before. But he's there. Uh, and so I, if you look underneath all that stuff, you'll see demon coins. You'll also see my teeth. You also see Van Gogh. Those are the obvious ones. Uh, Monet. And thinking about that, when I think of Van Gogh and, and Cezanne and all those guys, uh, they travel to other places. And that, too, helped me to uh, 
enjoy being in Venezuela and understanding. <coughs> so when I when you see the works, how much uh, being another country has influenced my works, I think about uh, uh, Billy Gauguin and Tahiti or Van Gogh and Harold or Cezanne and Rabion. They, uh, I understand what they must have felt going to a foreign country and being inspired because I know how I felt living in Venezuela and how that affected me and my work. What about Soutine? Because I remember well, our answer to that. Yeah. 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 We were in love yeah. with that. Good God. We went, we went, we went to the Rice. Yes. We went, we went to the bicycle ride. We, we took a bike and the bicycle ride to the Rice Museum. And uh, I saw uh, at a women, and that was this Soutine. And they heard me yell. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and so I. And what, what was the painting? Do you remember? Piece of meat, a yeah. really tiny <laughs> slab of meat. And when I came back, I found the slaughterhouse. <laughs> and ended up going to oh, the slaughterhouse. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then one of the students uh, of um, Greta Fugale, her, her parents getting a, 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 a deli. Anyway, they bought a whole truckload of, of, of lambs, whole lamb that they, and so I had a chance to, they fill the lamb up and, and so, yeah. That was so there's one. work from that inspired by that? Uh, uh, that one. Well, there's one piece of meat, and it's glad to meat that I took from Amsterdam. Oh. But I did go there and, and, and took all the photographs of the onion slabs of meat in the end, that is our father's and uh, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering um, what instructors, possibly, that you had that oh. also led to, to that encouraged this drawing aspect okay. of your okay. practice. Okay, well, Louis Mingo Jones and Howard uh, was also in the fiscal, uh, Professor Porter, James Porter. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're uh, affected by your teachers. I had a wonderful figure to my teacher, her name was Nala Asher. And uh, I remember when I you was know, at the Skowhegan, uh, all of those. Uh, Three minute drawings or 30 second drawings or one minute sketches we did, uh, I was really prepared to do them. So they would do three minutes. I had too much time <laughs> for that because I was doing so many 30 second and one minute drawings. So, uh, I didn't have Demon Coin at uh, Scott Heaven that year, it was 1966, <laughs> but I had a uh, Bishop, and uh, that was my second choice. Wow. And so, uh, uh, I, I, he critiqued me. I don't remember everything that he said to me, but whatever he said, I remember, remember it being a very good critique. But I don't remember exactly what he said. I was inspired by what he said. Uh, it's not even at that time. So the, that, that was true. I mean, you know, every artist that I uh, uh, have come across, I've learned something from them. Now that you have the internet, I said, where was the internet when I was in <laughs> Much less. <laughs> but you know, there are times now when I can go, well, I want to look at Cezanne and let me have fun with Cezanne. So I pull up all the Cezannes and just not really study them and go click, 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 and just let them come at me. Uh, and, and do that. Oh, I can could, I could spend it with anybody. Uh, I remember once I was looking at uh, doing this uh, bromelia, I was seeing with the bromelia. And I, yeah, and I was saying, well, how is this thing uh, constructed? And I was going through all the emotions, I was coming from here. And I was like, oh, you're crazy, oh, you're becoming the familiar. <laughs> and then I thought about what I learned in a drama class with Stanislavski. I took this intro to the theater class, and, I, and after all of these years, I, I thought about Stanislavski and the whole method acting. And I said, well, I can use that as part of the you use your whole body. You use everything, the music, uh, all of the senses become uh, involved in, in the work. And so, I mean, dance, theater, music, it's all intertwined for me. And so, I hope you'll see it. I think you can, right? Yeah. We all look around, we can see that. Uh, so you tell us a little bit about uh, what do we need to do for a couple of questions. I want to hear how he influenced you and how you, what influenced your work. Well, I, I was just going to start with my impression of Franklin, which is I think the impression that everybody has here today, just how much energy this man has and the physicality of his work, um, which always struck me from making, you've always been like this fountain um, of youth and energy. Right, but you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
but certainly, and then as, as far as technique, like I, I'd like to pass, I don't have many, but I, I have a couple of handouts that um, I can just show you. Just, just as you can that. Okay, okay, so I'm just gonna give two, and you guys should, can just pass them on. Just to show you the work that I was doing back then when I knew Franklin. Some of the things, we just say, I, I only have a couple of things. <laughs> But I think because this is a painting of the technique that I do now, and I think you can see more in the, in, in the photos that are coming around about how Franklin influenced me. Now back when I had my uh, senior thesis exhibit at the Corcoran, you could definitely see it in the work. Like I was working, first of all, life size. <laughs> I was working like six foot tall, and they were drawings on paper. They were pastel and they were uh, colored pencil. And it was like I was very interested in drawing, and that definitely stems from Franklin. But well, we ran all the, all the all the materials, all the black. Mm -hmm. The first semester was black and white. The second semester was color. Yeah. And so we ran through all of the techniques mm -hmm. that we wanted. Uh, and I just believe in it. And also those those homework assignments that we did. And not only were you drawing in class, but you didn't have those homework assignments. Oh, and yes, yeah, so and they were. And they, they, were, they were rough situations. <laughs> yeah, they were intense. They were, it was a lot of academic stuff. And I used what I learned from you, that foundation here, really to propel me through the entire four years. Because the rest of, after that, you know, um, the teachers that I had were not realists. And that was what I was interested in. Um, but the work that I do today is, it's oil painting. And if you pull the hood back, which is what I took to Chantel, the thinking is still there. So when I'm, I'm painting, I'm very much thinking about drawing. Particularly so when I'm correcting things, you know, and um, and there's two ways that you can look at drawing. You can look at drawing as uh, I think I you know, mentioned this previously as a, a linear mark, like we're seeing over here. Franklin, is that the Vermilion there on the uh, the one? Yes. Oh, okay. What is what is the one right here? Um, with the and ladies the Ricky, here. Ricky. Oh, the, and the, the Ricky Ricky. Ricky, Ricky, Ricky yes, yes. That has more of the pinker tones. I mean, you can really see the linear quality of his technique in that. The smaller one. Yes. The bigger one is later and it becomes yes. more painful. More, more, you can, so, exactly. Well, well and I, I was thinking it's a bit more. It's a The one, the one on the, the left. left. Yes, the purple one. You can really see the linear mark mm -hmm. making there. Whereas painters are yeah. um, usually thinking more in terms of planar make, you know, marks, and that you can see more of that shift in, in the larger piece right next to, right next to him. Um, and so even though on the surface, you know, these look different. The thinking is still very much there. So underneath all of the embellishment, yes. you know, or how to break, break the composition up, or what kind of structure or design, or the, 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 it's like a coloring book in a sense. How can you block it out and then embellish it out if you need to? Yeah. Yeah, and even the, the, the medium he's using, the oil pastels, they are crayons. Mm -hmm. they, they lend themselves to the, that drawing you know, approach. He's not working with brushes with these at all. Like this no, is, no, I'm not. This is a departure. But they become painterly because um, just as, as like you have hard and soft uh, pencils, they are hard and soft or pastels. And it depends on the brand. And after all of these years, I uh, uh, I've used so many different brands. Uh, you can uh, decide, do you want a hard oil pastel or do you want a, a softer version? Some are more creamy than others. So just as you use hard and soft pencils, you will use hard and soft crayons. Just as you have uh, uh, thin and thick crayons, you'll have thin and, uh, thin, thin and thick brushes or wide and soft brushes. You can have wide and, and narrow crayons as well. So it, it works back and forth. So when you're shifting to that painterly technique, you're going more planar? You're using the sides of your well, see, cells? You don't really control it that much. I mean, I know that what I have to do while I'm projecting. And so if I'm going to pick up a frame and make a mark, there are times when I think I'm going to make this mark, but sometimes I'll get surprised. They'll do something completely different. As I said, they have a mind of their own. And I might pick up a crayon and make a thin linear mark, pick up the same crayon, and it'll do something completely different. Also, because of the surface quality, it'll react differently because of all the buildup of, of crayons. And so you never know. There are times when I go to make a mark and it won't move, which means there's too much crayon here. I won't 
let you put another drop of crayon in this place, go someplace else, so I can put someplace else, or the time block goes to make a mark, and it just simply to adhere to the surface, so just move on and go someplace else. Or I'll make a mark and it stays there, and there's more trouble to pull it off, so just leave it on and mash it in and go on to something else. That's what happens. Uh, so as I said, they have a mind of their own sometimes. Do they, uh, do they stay open, the oil pastels? Like, are you able to still manipulate them? Like, how, when do oh, they dry? Okay. Uh, I have been, well, first of all, they make a, a spray for oil pastels now. And uh, I was buying so much of that spray that a plaza hit a little shelf in the front of the white. <laughs> Save them, spray them. them. Uh, it gets a little out of hand. But what I have done is, uh, uh, I think like my friend Sylvia uh, Snowden came to the studio one day and she said, you can take a thin coat of this gloss varnish across and you can put a thin coat of it. Once it dries, you can build up theirs. Mm -hmm. So in some of these, I, I, I put this thin layer of, of varnish on top of acrylic varnish. And once it dries, it builds up well. After several months of building up, uh, and one time after I threw all my yellows, just put this little thin coat of meat, I let it dry and do the red and put a thin coat of meat, but it goes on and on and on. Now I'm trying, it, so, it, so there just six months, and to put, if I put one coat of meat over the whole thing each day, after six months, and building up the surface of crayon, it's going to build up, and that's why it's very tactile. Also, sometimes it, 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 uh, it, I, uh, it sticks to the surface. You just leave it. And so again, that's how you get all of the uh, uh, textures. But it's, it's fun uh, to uh, build up layers and layers and layers. Uh, at the very end, I might spray. But uh, it's, it's, it's putting a varnish in between them and building up there in one layer, which is why you get this paint of quality. Also, uh, there are times when I, can, I try to get a thin line, it just won't do that. So it just match in and, and it becomes pink. And you just leave it. And you, you'll see my front friends are going through the pieces. Or, or you'll leave the crayons there and let them build the surface on the side. So I hope that. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so and, and um, if I could add. I'll just <laughs> run away with all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> When you look at the works, so that what what any artist really wants to achieve, and I know this room is filled with artists, um, is you want to create a window into another world. And Franklin definitely has that with all of his work here today. Um, I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about about the techniques that you're using here. Like for instance, with the moth, like there's almost a sense of camouflage that this moth perfectly embodies the the background. It's not like you can really separate the moth from the background. It's the perfect fusion. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and, well, that is called a tara, and and uh, <laughs> the tara, and uh, I think I uh, painted uh, the brown is the color of the paper. Right, hold it closer. The brown is the color of the paper, and uh, this was a moth that was on the street on the sidewalk, and I just I hit them when I was I, when I was jogging. I, just, I, I had them so a pouch in my shorts. So I had my camera with me at all times, <laughs> put it in a strategic location, and I could pull it out and photograph as I put them on. And so uh, those moths appear everywhere. And so um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the more subtle ones. One of my favorite artists in Venezuela, when I did this show at the Tobar Museum, uh, his name is Nesta Ali Quinones, and I loved his work. He came to the show, and out of all the works that I hit there. He chose this one, which is one of the most subtle ones. I mean, I, I like it, you know, <laughs> blaring and all that, but uh, he chose this one because he liked something about the sun. It's beautifully yeah. yes, yes. So, but I mean, I, I, I like all that. And it happens here too. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the foreground and this, you know. I, I did this. <clears throat> they, 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 this is the, this is called the Frawley Home. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Frawley Home. And I went to, up in the mountains of Venezuela, it's, it's called Paramo. And this grows way up in the mountains. And it's, 
and uh, they make uh, medicine out of it and potions and so forth. But it, it's, uh, it blooms in October. And um, I went there specifically to paint the Crawley Home. They nicknamed me uh, when I did an interview. I did so many Crawley Home, I was called the Green Goat Painter. <laughs> and so, but, so when they nicknamed me that, I did the huge bromeliad. And when I did the show and with the publicity shots were done, everybody wanted to be photographed from the bromeliad. So I said, well, I'm the Green Goat Painter of Crawley Home. They could do a monument of Crawley Home and maybe that would compete. And so, I find that people that people are responding to this one as well. So yes. that justifies me being called the green thing. I love it. I embrace it. I, you know, we could, I could, I could do a whole show of Charlie on it all myself. The green book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Piling the materials on. Uh, uh, it, speaking of piling it on, I, this was the very first piece I did uh, in Venezuela when I first arrived. Uh, a, a little before um, nine, I, I, I arrived in, in Venezuela on the third, and then a few days later, 9 11 happened, and so I was there doing this piece. But this is the very first piece. Now, it was it's just began to set up studio, uh, trying to um, just get adjusted to being in a foreign country and then set up studio. I had one a little tiny room. So I took the bed with the bed the bed on the terrace and took the bedroom and turned that into the studio. I didn't see it. And I would have to get in the bed from the end. I couldn't get on either side. <laughs> but I was plodding along. It's called the Gala Apples. I was photographing everything in sight. And so this is one of the from the one that vendors. I think he spelled it wrong. Right. I think he wants to say galas with an S. And I think it came like galas. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know what the price of uh, apples were at that time, but if you go back to 2001, seven apples for a thousand bolivars, who knows what it, it is now. So you have to check. But uh, someone looks, oh my God, look at the price. Look how look the cost. The exchange rate was just, well, the, the, the bolivar is down now, so who knows what that is. But, I took all my broken crayons and just mashed them in because I was working so hard to finish it. I've got to do something. So let's just put all the stuff there, get it off the wall, make a statement, and move on to something else. And so this was the second one. So you can see that it's a little different. And, and um, so, so probably I was looking for this when I did that one. And so and then this is the third one. So you get an idea of the first one, the second one. <clears throat> this comes closer to what I was really looking for. Uh, the peacock is something that um, I really like because I, I, in one of the reasons for me going to uh, Venezuela uh, was to uh, enjoy the culture and understanding what um, uh, I just wanted to be in Latin America for Christmas, and so in 1995, I went to Venezuela, uh, and, and uh, I wanted to see what it would be like to be at Christmas in Venezuela and uh, New Year's in Puerto Rico. So, uh, but I wanted to understand the culture, and I was telling someone you have to embrace the culture. So I went to a part of Dura El Nino, and uh, it's a, a, a holiday between Christmas and New Year's where you go to someone's home and they uh, have prayers. Every, everyone has a manger. And you have prayers and you walk around and um, uh, uh, light candles and a procession. And at the end, they have this huge feast. And so when I went there, there were these peacocks all over the place. Now, here in the States, I would go to a farm and that chickens walk around. Yeah. There, I had peacocks. Velvet paper, <laughs> and you got cheeks and stuff. You see those elves. Well, I, if, if you put a coat of a gloss medium over that velvet paper once it's dry, it's like drawing on sandpaper. Mm -hmm. And so the crayon stuck. I said, I like that. So uh, the red. And also, I played a game with myself. Uh, the paper's red. 
uh, let the paper do the work for you. How much, uh, how little can I do to the paper and still make the image come across? So I want to do a minimum amount of work and let the paper do the work. Whereas in this one, I decided to pack. The paper, is, the red is the paper that's bleeding through. Whereas the, uh, this, the paper dominates. I had to do something different to the second version. I like them both. Uh, this is where I am now. So you'll see the thinner versions of it. Uh, but I love that plant. I will do other, but it's just like a new experience uh, that I'm getting uh, when I look when I look at all these things. Bromeliads. <coughs> back in the '70s, I did bromeliads, but there was a kind of bromeliad that I would find in the supermarket. There. I think every tree in, in well, every tree in Merida has some form of bromeliad on it. And so I fell in love with the idea that bromeliads are out everywhere. And so I learned um, to see them in different ways. I went to this, I went to a uh, silk festival uh, with silkworms and and, and uh, mulberry bushes. But I fell in love with with the bromeliads on this estate as opposed to uh, getting involved in the uh, silk festival. And <laughs> so anyway, this is this, so I love bromeliads and, and I did a whole series of bromeliads as well. Uh, I had, oh, okay, the soup. Uh, when I'm, I'm a foodie and I, and I love uh, going to restaurants and so forth. And one of my favorite places is, uh, uh, Pete Alexander's. She's a wonderful chef in Venezuela, and her food is beautiful to look at, but also it's delicious as well. So the, the soup, she brought the soup to me. I was so excited. I started eating the soup. I said, oh my God, I didn't photograph it. <laughs> so I told her she bought a second one. <laughs> so I had two soups that day, and I said, I'm not going to send it. That's a piggy we get two soups. And the fish. I, w I was talking, you know, living in Venezuela, uh, in America, it's the landscape that was so important to me. And uh, that was the times that I did go and look at Cezanne and pull up Cezanne and just get an idea of what he did. But I'm surrounded by this landscape. So, so there are times when I cannot see the image uh, or cannot focus in on the image. But if I think of it as a landscape, I can break it down and be able to see it. So when you look at some of this stuff in here, the carrot and the, the uh, green beans and the piece of fish, I was seeing this as a landscape. And I was able to uh, uh, pull it together or understand how, how it's constructed. So sometimes for me, uh, if I'm getting in trouble, just switch around and think of it as a landscape. This is, again, I had never seen a plant. It's called Ricky Ricky. I like the name, too. It's your Ricky Ricky. Uh, but I fell in love with uh, the notion of, uh, of this plant and how it dangled. And again, something I've never seen before. It's like, I mean, I'm a city guy in Washington, D.C., and here I am out in the middle of nowhere, and all of these exotic things are around me. And so, uh, this is one of them. I had fun with this too. Well, you, this really does. Sometimes the crayon sticks, but you just leave it, <laughs> leave it there. And but also, when I'm working, sometimes I come across. Oh, I hit a roadblock, so you can't go any further. And then also that gets what you mash. I mean, you can. You can see where I've mashed it in. I don't think the thumbprint is there, to, but you'll see the thumbprints all over the place. Uh, it's, it's being physical with the uh, material. I mean, I, I, I make it physical. I love, uh, I don't like doing this or that. I've got to get, you know, my whole body into it. And, that. and it, you know, it keeps, me, it keeps me in shape too, you know, because you don't have to reach and get down and move. And uh, attack it. It's not a passive in terms of how I approach. I love to go at it and attack. And as I said, the more fun I'm having, the thicker the material is. 
I think what we're seeing is that the artistic work is really synonymous with the artist brand. Um, each of these you know, brilliant artists have become their own different entities. As the works evolve, as their techniques have evolved, so have they evolved. Uh, so I think what you just saw with Franklin's evolution of each work, not only did he use the paper differently, he used the medium differently, um, there was something happening behind the scenes within him as a person. He was thinking about his experience. Um, he wanted to be in Venezuela during Christmas. And so it's not surprising that he would photograph a turkey. Uh, so I, I think what you're seeing, and, and it's one of the things I wanted to bring forth in this talk, is that these are two people that have evolved. I love the way Suzanne, during our conversation, talked about her product giving life and birthing her career. Um, in the same way that Franklin talked about how he started off with these paintings that were larger than life, and they were paintings using paint. And now they've evolved into the Dubuhu Pintoras, which are the painting drawings. So I, I would love to have an opportunity for the audience, audience to get involved and ask questions. Um, so this is your time to take advantage of these two brilliant artists and just find out whatever you want to know. So, and I'll come around with the mic. Yes. Okay. Right I'm curious about something. Mm -hmm. If you're using paper and then you're using oil, mm -hmm. I always just thought you had to have a buffer between oil and paper. Okay, I take okay. Uh, this is actually four sheets of paper together because, uh, with, you know, when I'm in Venezuela, you can't always get paper the size that you want. So, because I have taught painting and or acrylic painting and mediums and all that. I have bonded four pieces of that. You might see the scene. I see about power enough crayon on this. Uh, you, no one's going to see the scene. But I, I take a, 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 a solution of gel, gesso, marbling paste, and sand. And I will bond the four pieces. Of, I will take the back, bond the four pieces of paper together uh, 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 on the back, and then paint the scene. With the medium. Once it's dry, I might do a second coat with this combination of, of gel, medium, sand, mono, and paint the whole thing. And then after that, and that, that may take so that's, two. That's two. that barrier you're talking about. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Nowadays, uh, there's a lot of artists working on paper. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, paper that you can buy that's specifically made arches oil paper. I work on it a lot. Arches oil? Arches oil paper, yes. And you can paint directly on it without having to. To do what he was describing. Yeah, but this was because I wanted to work large yeah. and I couldn't do anything. Even now that I can get a, a large piece of paper, since I've been back home, uh, I still put that solution of sand and modeling paste because I like the surface that look. Yes, because remember when I said that when, when, when you uh, uh, paint gloss medium or medium over the uh, uh, the lower paper or the velvet paper, it treat, it's like sandpaper. So I try to create that same surface even on a larger scale. So I mix sand, gesso, marbling paste, gel, and then paint that whole solution. And then I have to paint a color. This is done on the brown, the same brown that, that the uh, moth is. I paint the whole thing brown just to give up, decide what color I need to have even through like I did the red. This is brown. Uh, that's yellow paper, the bug. The bug crawled into the studio and never picked my leaves. So I decided to photograph it. As it stayed, I'm working in the dark, I'll step on these gone. So I picked them up, took them outside, he came back. So I decided, <laughs> we played this game for a while, and I decided, well, let me just photograph it. Photograph it, and again, to pick it up and put it in different situations. On the blue background, on the yellow background. Once I did that photograph, that was all again, so that's that. Do you wonder what kind of fun that is? I don't know, but I feel like I call it La Cucaracha. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's it's like the song, La Cucaracha. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I, mean, I, I said, in Venezuela, even the bugs, if you look at them, I thought everything was just so new and, and alive and exciting for me. Uh, so, yeah. But that's what I get. First of all, I'm Good day um, I'm an art enthusiast. I'm a performing in arts, and I direct plays and I produce. So when you talked about the Stanislavski, uh -huh. it just 
showed me the methods inside. And so when I look at <coughs> your paintings, they come at me and you can see different things. And I just want you to know I'm just excited that I can see different things every time. And you talk about you like that that one there, but I love your beginning work. Oh, okay. Okay, so for me, I just think that's just amazing. And for me, to do realism, to see you do that, I work in a visual arts department, and to, I don't, a lot of people are not doing realism today. They are all into illustration and all this visual art stuff. So just to see that amazing work that you drew there and, and the career that you have, I'm just so amazed because I'm always wondering how you create that form of life. So it's really how far you take it. Thank you. That's a wonderful yeah. question. I, I think of, and frankly, you probably look at it the same way, representation is really on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So on one end, you have tightly, tightly rendered work like Vermeer, like myself, you know? And then on, on the other end, you can have full abstraction. Well, you know, even abstract artists were painting things. That's yes. representational work. So it's just a spectrum. So as artists, we get to decide where on that spectrum we're going to fall. Exactly how much of things do we want to include, and what materials you use definitely lends to that feel. So when when Franco talks about laying all of these layers of this modeling case yes. and the sand, it is to, for the end effect. You know, he wants it to also be part of the surface quality of his work that that lends to this very you know, modern interpretation of, right. of, of realism, because he's, he's definitely a realist painter. Right. I like to see things. <laughs> and also, uh, uh, I like the words, too. Like, sometimes words can include, like, when, when, when I'm listening to Bob Dylan, I would be trying, I would take a Bob Dylan song, and so what does he, what does this mean? And take his images, or Laura Nero, she did, she talked about a pearl in a washing like a pearl in a washing So the word, the music. The lyrics, too, because when you listen to my Spanish music, it's those boleros and ballads that I, that I relate to. I, instrumentals, I can appreciate instrumentals. I think of an abstract artist is one who would listen to instrumentals. But as a representational artist, I need the words. I need the words. Romance. Yes, yes, of yes, course. Yes. That's why I like the boleros and ballads. That yes. come, you know, that, that, and, and the emotion uh, that, that comes across uh, in the so, yeah, yes. Um, did you um, consciously go to Venezuela in that area of Venezuela, or did you stumble onto Venezuela in that area? Oh, okay. great question. Okay. All right, a friend of mine, of, of my buddy, of James Pitts, wanted to go to Costa Rica. And so, and so, we want to spend Christmas in Costa Rica and then go to um, uh, uh, Puerto Rico for New Year's. And so the notion is we go from Washington to Miami, from Miami to Costa Rica, from Costa Rica back to Miami, and then on to Puerto Rico. And I said, that is ridiculous. <laughs> so the, the, and here in American Union, I went to travel agency here at American University, and he said, well, you know, why not Caracas? I mean, a friend of mine went down there and loved Caracas, so people go to Caracas. <laughs> went to Caracas and never went anywhere else. They nope. stayed there. My buddy never went back, except to help me move from one place to the other. I went there and just completely lost my mind. I think that year, when I first went in, in that uh, uh, December, we had uh, President's Weekend in February. So I went back to Venezuela. And then, in, in uh, March, we had spring break, so I went back in March. And then that summer, I said, I'll teach summer school, make a little money, I'll go back and spend the month with all of us there. So I was actually smitten with the things I saw, the music I heard. It was just wonderful does being it, down there. Does it go back a little further? I'm wondering, do you remember in the 90s, Latin American art was really hot? Okay. Really hot. Were you at all interested in No, this? no, I, I mean, I, uh, again, my buddy James said, you know, we, we, we're taking the, I'm taking the Spanish class, and so we need one more person for the class to run. So he persuaded me to take the class. And I continued, not that my Spanish is that great, but he continued, and as I said, he never went back. You know, he, he got me started, so I, well, uh, he, I dedicated, he passed away at 92 a couple of years ago. But, so you can see James Prince in the cab, oh, you know, he's my, he's my buddy. Uh, so, uh, but he never went. He, he never went back except he helped me move. 
But I, I owe him a great debt because he started me, and then of course my friend David over there started talking to me about Venezuela and another that, that, so that's how it all started. It was just on a whim. And uh, I had no idea that I'd fall in love with that country, that I would be so smitten with all things Latin I could see, uh, the music, the culture, I mean, where would I go, go get to go to a part of Dora? and see peacocks walking around like chickens, <laughs> or the flowers that I've never seen before, or see how much, I mean, I'm a city guy, and to see that the landscape had that much influence over me. Is that why it had such an influence on you? If, if you're a city guy, you're seeing vertically, mostly because of all the tall buildings, right? So was it something yeah, you see it all horizontally like that? It was just, you know, there. yeah, we have buildings here, that buildings there. It's just that in there, they particularly, I mean, well, Caracas sits in a valley, so that the mountains all over. In Merida, there was just this beautiful, all around the beautiful landscape. It was just beautiful. And it's the light. For some reason, when I was there, my friend would say, when we came back, it was like we had a shot of adrenaline. You just <laughs> so emotional and living in that place that, that, you know, uh, Relax. He looked so relaxed when he came back, and so I it was something about being there. When I got there, I was ignited. The colors seemed brighter. Uh, things seemed crystal clear. I remember when I first started photographing. I was photographing every second. I said, "Let's calm down. <laughs> Pick and choose very carefully what you're going to photograph, because I, everything I saw was exciting." Well, one of the things that we talked about, even just today, we talked about how working in a higher education setting, um, that you can become consumed. You give so much to your students, you can give so much to the yeah. educational process, and then those little breaks that you get aren't quite enough. Mm -hmm. And I think when he would have some of those breaks, we'd go to Venezuela, mm -hmm. life would slow down. Mm -hmm. He could see, taste, feel in a richer ways, and I think it became addicting. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I mean, the smells, the sounds, everything. Uh, was just so exciting and new, mm -hmm. and new. I was, I was also talking about my materials. And, you know, I've been using oil pastels for many, many, many years. And when I, uh, uh, I'm still learning of what this material will do. I was telling uh, someone that when I was a student at Howard, uh, Judith Anderson came to uh, uh, perform at Cranston Auditorium. And she did Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking scene. This is probably 1962-63. She did Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking scene and a scene from Medea. She went back to talk to the art students, uh, to the drama students, and I was, I was hanging out with the drama students. And she, they were, she was asked, how can you uh, do the same role over and over again and, and uh, bring freshness to it? And she said, I'm still learning about that character and the nuances and subtleties that I'm learning. Well, I understood it then. Now that I'm 80, I understand what she means that after all of these years, I'm still learning new things about this material. And hope that I learn, keep you know, learning and expanding. And one of the things we find, I find so fascinating, having been painting for nearly six decades, is his um, ability to navigate technology at 80. Um, I, we, you know, we talk about you're, you're doing great. He does a great job. <laughs> and kicking he does a great job. Um, so believe it or not, you know, all by himself, while he is creating a current work and a few others, he is narrating his technique along the way and recording his himself. Um, and so one thing you can look out for in the next decade. Um, is some time lapses, some progression analysis that we've done. And the first one is the one you'll see on the corner um, with the La Vista Mi Terraza is um, a time lapse that we put together um, to show the work in progress progression. So uh, that's something that I'm very proud of that, you know, having been working before, I think what the kids say when telephones are still pasted to the wall, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> He has now been able to evolve um, in every way. So, any more questions? Um, I'd like to get some more time. Yes. In, the, in the back. Yes. We'll, we'll... 
Okay, I've got two questions. Yes. Uh, I'll start with the easy one, okay. which is I noticed that you don't have any frames on your work. No. And that's a conscious decision? Yes. Because you want everything sort of to right. flow off to the edge. I, it, it seemed too much. And, and uh, no. I don't like to control. I love this irregular movement. And also, when I make a mark, you can't stop the motion. And so if I'm doing this all over, you're going to get that irregular movement. And a frame, I, if I would ever think about a frame, it's going to be a very thin something. Gallery. Right, mm -hmm. because I love the irregularity. I don't want to control uh, the edges, to break free of the rigid, right? Doesn't, there are no straight lines in any of my so why would I want it on the edge? Mm -hmm. So I love this. What, however it happens out there, or even if I have to pull from out there into the work, it still will have that irregular movement along the, the edge. Especially the first glass stone, the emperor door. That whole irregular edge. I didn't force this. This was created because of all of the movement going from here and wherever it stopped. And also, I just sort of let it tear on its own, mm -hmm. uncontrolled. Let it speak for itself. And that's all of them. But not everything, but if I, if I would do anything, maybe cover up. But I can't wait. Mm -hmm. Because you can see where it went and you know. Also, if you if if your perspective is correct and you make the mark, it's gonna meet out there in space somewhere. And I want that continuum, continuation happening as well. Okay, the second part yeah, uh -huh. is um, your wonderful curator spoke about your going to Howard. But yes, before that, when you were growing up. Uh, was there anybody in your family who was artistic? Yeah. Or did you have anything like in the background uh -huh. that really brought you to art? Well, you, uh, my stepfather was a mm -hmm. painter, a Drew, as well. And so he would do little things. And uh, I also got a lot of paint on my set as a kid <laughs> uh, and, and crayons. I have a cousin on my father's side, uh, a Bob Braxton. And uh, he was a, a, a graphic designer in the fifties in New York. So yeah, it's in the family as well, on both sides. Uh, and, and, and I was also encouraged to do so. Um, yeah, I, I, but I, I remember the paint by number six and those Walter T. Foster books that I got uh, to draw from. Okay, we have one more question. Yeah. Uh, Two. Um, you talked about taking photographs a lot. Can you talk about how you use photographs or projection uh -huh. in your work? Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm, this you have to do your thing. I'm doing that. Uh, so I'm description you give to the podcast about. We're going to do it now. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. You know. Okay. Let's let's just say I'm, 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 I have a projector that's sitting right here, and I'm projecting here. Okay. And so, <laughs> I have to hold, and this is my, I have to hold a piece of paper in front of the projector for this thing, I'm right in it. I have to hold a piece of paper, and, and I have to see the image. Once all of this color is there, I'm not going to know where to put it unless I put a piece of paper to see the image that's projected onto the uh, surface, and then I can take my crayon and guide myself. Are you understanding? Yeah. Okay. All right. I used to watch the bullfights uh, in, in uh, Venezuela. I love, every Sunday, I would look forward to the bullfights. And I love the melody. You know, you get in the studio and you act and silly and you uh, listen to the music. Well, I always thought of my piece of paper as the bull, the matadors came. So I became the matador. And so when he would go in for the kill, I would pull my piece of paper up to my, 
you know, and, this, and my crayon is the, is the sword, and the work is the bull, and I'd go in for the kill. Well, you know, when you're in the studio and your music's playing, you have fun. And so, you want that joy to come out in the work. And so, you know, I also become a, my favorite tennis player right now is the school fellow, uh, Carlos Alcaraz. And so he does a backhand, <laughs> and you know, a forehand. <coughs> I'm going to do it too. I mean, we've all done that but with your favorite athletes and so forth. So, anyway. Uh, yeah. hey, one thing I noticed is that your work looks a lot different in person than it does online or in a photograph. It's difficult to capture the texture and the gloss in the photograph. My other question is about the process of curating the show. So I don't know whether who wants to talk about that or whether you work together on that. Yes, I don't know. Yes. Well, I, that's a very good question. So I don't know if many of you know that I'm, I'm Franklin's niece um, on his mother's side. So it's this sort of a family affair. And this whole process began really before he knew it. Um, he <laughs> obviously had been in Venezuela for many years, and you know he was always my favorite uncle. Um, I would always have him. I hate to say that, but he was. Um, <laughs> or is, should I say. Um, we're from Richmond, Virginia. I currently live there, and um, I'm actually a psychotherapist by trade. So I'm not in the art community. Um, but I had been thinking about him and, and realizing his 80th birthday was coming up, I've been thinking about ways to honor him and thinking about, you know, we often have our giants in the family, people that we say, oh, I have a famous uncle or famous auntie. Um, but, but nothing happens beyond that. People don't do anything other than brag um, <laughs> about it. And so I thought to myself, wow, you know, I've got this larger than life person in my family. And I'd always looked up to him um, when I thought educationally what I thought I'd be capable of, you know. Can I get a doctorate? Of course I can. My Uncle Frankie's a professor. I can do it. So he really inspired me all the way through, um, even though we would take different paths. Um, so I am a writer, so I just love to write, and I've been writing and thinking, I'll just write a book. I'll write his autobiography. Then I started thinking about, well, he hasn't shown in 20 years. What will I write about? Maybe I'll do you know, something about our history. And then he came down. He happened to be in Richmond for Christmas. One sighting that I thought we would never have him captive for an extended period of time. And so I opened up my book and I said, here's what I've been planning for you. I want to write a book about your, your life. And um, as a therapist, I'm always fascinated about singularity and existentialism and how people can, you know, live alone and, and what that does to their health and their well-being. Some people don't do loneliness well. Right. He seems to thrive <laughs> in loneliness. Um, and then he can, he's very extroverted. So again, I find him very fascinating. So um, we started with this thought of a, a show and uh, he said, you know, I want to go to American University. I've been trying to get into American forever. And I said, well, let, let me dig and see if I can find someone that might be interested. Uh, and we had everything, we were just talking about it, and he had all of these paintings, um, pictures from the website. And so I put a document together, and over dinner, he just started talking about each painting, and all the things, the stories behind every painting, and I just wrote and wrote and wrote for hours. We just talked. And then about three weeks later, Jack called. And, and he said, you're not going to believe this. Jack reached out to me. He wants to do a show. He wants me to do this show for America. And so I told him that Christmas. I said, you see, Uncle, if you put it out in the universe, you never know what will happen. So it, it's literally it was something we were thinking about um, and talking about, unbeknownst to uh, Mr. Ray, the doctor, Rasmussen. Um, that we were going to be doing this show, we didn't know it. So to answer your question, I do not have an art background, but I think as Uncle Frankie said, it's in the blood. Um, I just kind of, I, I did what feels right to me, and I wanted to honor him in the most best way possible. And so here we are. I think that our family does give us intangible gifts that we don't realize and um, just him being who he is was a gift to me and so I wanted to do this 
for him. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thankful to have the gifts and the ability to do this. So, and thank you to Jack. I have to say this because um, he was very, he didn't know anything about me. <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. I, it was really one of those things where I, I, I kind of looked at him and I said, I think I could do this. And he said, okay, go for it. And um, so I appreciate the confidence. Yeah.